How to be your own best friend. Mildred Newman and Bernard Berkowitz with Gene Owen. There's no pill made that is as simple and effective and fast working as how to be your own best friend. If I'm gloomy, I read it twice a day with a glass of water. It has never failed to uplift me. I want to tell you that it's magic, but the whole point of this book is that there is no magic. So instead, let me simplify and let me say that I can't live without it. At a time of trouble and confusion in my life, this book has seemed to be a deep breath of mountain air. A wonderful prescription in the blahs and the antidote of weariness and discouragement of loneliness. They explain. They explain in a simple layman's terms, in layman's terms, of each person and how to both to innate ability to the power to be happy, of making emotional choices freely and to realize one's potential more freely. What the Berkowitz on earth is too often forgotten, a form of human intercourse called getting to know me. Read it over and over. It's truly enjoyable, leaving the reader with a sense of relief, knowing that there is a logical reason for anxiety and frustration, a kind of psyche attract, pep talk, direction for people who have the patience to learn and operate a car but won't be bothered learning how to operate themselves, a formula to help people live more meaningful lives and give them the courage to overcoming the hang-ups that keep them from being happy. Seductively jargon-free, presented in a neat question-and-answer format, sensible advice how to give up childhood, accept yourself and your own journey, and deal with life on your own two feet. How to be your own best friend. Introduction. When Thoreau remarked that most men had lived lives of quiet desperation. He could not have been foreseen how noisy the desperation would have become. Modern man may suffer like this forebears, but he does not suffer in silence. Our malaise is articulate. We have talked about our troubles. More escapes hatches have been open to us today, and we eagerly jump to shoot. Work has been always available, but we can now take further refuge in the infinite varieties of entertainment. On the let 747 remove us from the scenes of our discontent. But more and more, what's bothering us? is up for discussion. We talk, of course, about what's wrong with the world, about our war, warfare, welfare, prices, pollution. We also talk about, frankly, than ever before, about what's our in our inner world, about frustration and boredom and anxiety, about difficulties in marriage and sex, about lack of fulfillment. In our lives, we may not be unhappier than the ancestors, but one thing is clear, we do not accept misery in our own natural state. Resignment is not for us. It is for, if we are unhappy, we feel cheated, displaced, left out, like someone who missed the golden ring. We protest either individually or collectively. As a cry of women's liber, liber, liberationalists and one right mind meaningful work to be satisfying lives, we take very seriously the pursuit of happiness and believe we deserve better than what we've got. Or do we? We state our grievances and readily locate their causes, our jobs, our husbands, unhappy childhoods, and many of us take steps to remove the offenders. We change careers, divorce, go to psychoanalysis, yet the rising decibels of complaints make it one wonder. Are we really doing all we can to make our lives more rewarding? Granted, granted that we live in a time of social upheaval and dissolving values where a man's chances and survival of anybody's guess who has opened to be us more options than the previous generation, to pull it mildly and to put it mildly, we don't seem to be making the most of them. Why don't we? How can we? These questions are posed to two Manhattan psychoanalysts, Dr. Bernard Berkowitz and Mildred Newman, a husband and wife who separately and together, working with groups, are paid, are gauged in helping people to better with their lives and their problem and to probing conversation follows. The conversation. People that say they want to be happy, yet real happiness seems to be an impossible dream. Everyone wants to Everyone reaches it so desperately, but many of us never seem to come any closer. What are we doing wrong? Why are so many people dissatisfied with many ways? Is it the times we live in? Do we expect too much? Do we want the wrong things? Well, it's not a bad thing and all, as all that. There are some plenty of people who have, pl have a wonderful time of their lives, and they're living to be a hilt of love for every minute. But they don't talk much about it. They're busy doing it. They don't usually write articles and go for analysis, yet it's true. Not enough people have the sense of zest in their daily lives. Too many people have just mastered the art of being happy. Too many people have just not mastered the art of being happy, which is the zest. To call it an art, do you think it's something that can be called, that can be learned, like dancing, making pottery? But I think that you're either way you're happy or you're not. You can't decide to be happy. You, you can do a lot of things, but if you don't see how you can how you can make happiness, you got to go after the things that hopefully will make you happy. But you really got to do is until then, after that you get them whether you will or not. In a sense, it's true. You can go, you can go after the things you hope will make you happy, but you really don't know until after you go after them whether they will. In a sense, it's true. You must be put in a part of a problem where people have in their own minds of their pursuit of happiness. They think there is something that will make them happy.
If they can just hold it, they expect happiness to be happy to them. They don't see it something that there's something that they have to do. People will go to a lot of trouble to learn French and physics or scuba diving, and they have the patience to learn to operate a car, but they won't bother learning how to operate themselves. That's a funny idea. You make it sound as if we should be standing on our own controls and pushing buttons. Should the art of living be more natural than that? Maybe it should, but for most of us, it's not. We are not born in the secret of how to live. Too many of us never learn it. There's nothing cold-blooded or mechanical about it, but there's many things that we have to learn to do. For example, first thing to do is to realize our probably we probably have been looking in the wrong place. The source is not outside us, it's within us. Most of us, has, most of us have begun to tap our own potential. We're operating many low and very low below our capacity, and we continue to as long as we are looking for someone to give us the key to our kingdom. We must realize the kingdom is in us. We already have the key. And what we do is we're waiting for permission to start living fully. But the only person who can give us the permission is ourselves. We accountability and we are accountable only to ourselves and for what happens to us in our lives. We must realize that we have a choice. We are responsible for our own good in our own good time. It seems to me like a strange idea. If it is up to us, if we could push a magic switch and turn on happiness, why doesn't everyone just do it? There is no magic switch, but there is an attitude to take responsibility for our lives, meaning making profound changes in the way you approach everything. We do everything that we can to avoid change, this responsibility. We should do much rather than blame someone or something or making us feel unhappy than take the steps to make us feel better. We even talk about our own feelings as if they were visitors from outer space. We say, this feeling came over me, or as if in a helpless creatures overwhelmed with a mysterious force instead of simply saying well i felt that way we speak and our feelings change from a sunny storm like weather over which we have no control this meteor this meteorolog this meteorological view of our emotions is very useful it takes us off the hook for us is the way we feel. We diminish ourselves just in order to push away the chance of choice. Never push away the chance of choice with your attitude. You know, I really find the hard of it I really find the hard to accept and hard to accept I mean feeling Feelings are mysterious. They come and go and most of the time. I don't know why. If I'm angry or upset about something, I can stop myself from breaking dishes or maybe breaking into tears. But I can't just stop being upset and miserable. I'm not sure I would even want to. After all, if something happened to me that hurt me, then I have the right to feel hurt. You certainly do. You have the right to your feelings and painful feelings just as much as happier ones. To feel that all that you could feel to be truly human. But often too many people cling to the unpleasant feelings that that courts them. Without fully realizing what they're doing, they actually bring themselves about. They do the things that can make them feel bad and then they say I couldn't help myself what most people say when that is that I didn't help myself you, sh you should help yourself but we can all help ourselves that's the fact is we can all help ourselves can we really that's an exciting and lovely thought I would like to hold on to that how could we do it in so many ways first you have to make a very basic decision do you want to lift yourself up or put yourself down are you your are you with yourself or are you against yourself you may seem a little strange in the question, but many people are literally their own worst enemy. If you decide to want to help yourself, you could choose to do the things to make you feel good about yourself instead of the things that make you feel terrible. You should do what gives you the pain. Why should you do something that gives you pain when you could just as easily work on the joy? That's an important question to ask yourself. Why do anything that gives you pain when you can do something that gives you joy? People worry about pollution, but the harm we do to ourselves is more dangerous than the damage we do to the environment. We don't need television or comic strips to pollute our minds. We do much more of an insufficient uh, of a sufficient job of it ourselves nobody has told us how to put himself nobody's told someone how to put himself down when people are looking for the faults or the shortcomings they have no trouble finding them and inventing them and they just and then they don't even if they don't really exist many people finding out the things that help them feel good about themselves is a real challenge to find things that actually make them feel good about themselves it's as if they had blinders on and shut out all the bright spots but there are plenty of people who seek nothing but the bright spots they think quite satisfactory as they are and as everything is if everything was wrong is with something else it's not with them and if anything is wrong it is with somebody else not them of course but they don't really believe it those who are working on hearts to convince themselves and others how great they are or how shutting out something how shutting something out they can't see the faults because they're afraid that they've got nothing else they can think of the choice between of being perfect and being worst thing that's ever lived the trouble is it's very hard to give up the way you're looking at yourself because you're based on refusing to look into yourself any change you really must look into yourself to see what you're doing wrong you must be able to see ways you're pulling yourself down and decide what isn't or is working and what you want to do then you can start doing things to give you the pride and pleasure of living life such as such as being aware of your own achievements when you do something you're proud of dwell on a little bit dwell on a little bit and praise yourself for a relish experience take it in we're all used to doing that for ourselves and for others so when we go wrong they call our attention to themselves and when things run well we can actively bring them to our attention this is for us to give ourselves recognition 
if we were to wait for something to come from others, we'll feel resentful when it doesn't, and when it does, we'll reject it. It's time for others to say it's not it's not what others say to us that counts. We all love praise, but we have ever noticed how quickly how glow from the compliments wears off. Now we're compliments ourselves, the glow stays with us. It's still good to hear it from others, but it doesn't matter as much if we have already heard it from ourselves. This is the tragedy of some marvelous performers who need endless applause to tell how great they are. Who feel a chill as soon as they enter their dressing rooms they have never heard it from themselves. I suppose it's for people who have to prove something over and over again because they never really believe it or some things over and over become because something they feel inside they don't really possess. People who can never get enough of anything. Yes, they're still looking for the wrong place and looking through and from the wrong place. Suppose to Don Juan was doing all those beds, uh, doing in all those beds. He could see the craziness, of course, clearly in the look of such an extreme examples, but all the fail to appreciate ourselves enough is someone in a diet of a week that goes off for the day and overeating is nothing compared to the orgy of self-incrimination he then indulges in what about the week he was on a diet he should give himself credit for that and go right back on it and though he wants himself the pitfall is is very likely not too much food could resist on the eighth day of temptation to tear down the wonder self-image that he's been building all week long that's something many of us are hard to take really feeling good in ourselves when we hate ourselves in the morning after we should ask where we get the biggest kick from and with activities night before from the following self-approach of following that day but what if you do feel lousy about yourself? That's a real thing too, isn't it? How can you tell someone to do things that make him feel good if he really doesn't think he's ter if if he really does think he's a terrible person? I suppose I suppose if someone said, "Look, I'm a terrible person and I like it that way. Leave me alone." There isn't much that I could tell him. But chances are that he wouldn't he wouldn't mean it. Most people are quite unhappy with making themselves miserable. There's unusual severe inner struggle going on. Part of a person's pushing himself down, another part is crying out. That's not where he belongs. It's a question of having some compassion about yourself. So when you're doing something that makes you feel bad inside, ask yourself whether it's not the way you want to feel. If it's not, then stop doing what makes you feel that way. Instead, do the things that make you feel good about yourself. Since you seem to know so many secrets, what are some of the other things that people can do? They really aren't secrets. People know much more than they are willing to admit. They keep secrets from themselves. Some of them are so simple. One fundamental thing, for example, is to meet your own expectations. If you have housework or homework or some other work to do and you're tempted to let it slide and ask yourself, how would you feel if you put it off? Do you have the sense that will give you a little disgust with yourself? Then go ahead and do the job and let yourself savor the feeling from getting having it done with. Enjoy the experience of being in charge of yourself. It's quite exhilarating. Housework and homework may be a small part of your life, but how you feel about yourself throughout the day of life itself and this process of an imagination, it's how you feel about doing something. It can turn up the surprises too. How you may discover that doing something other than housework may make you feel a little bit better about yourself in a particular day. You may decide to write a poem instead. Isn't that encouraging? People to be awfully self-centered, to have this vision of a woman greeting her husband, with a possessed gleam in her eye. When he comes home at night, she looks around in dismay and crying babies unmade beds and asking, where's dinner? And she waves a piece of paper and says, I wrote a poem instead. I think very few women should genuinely feel better about, I feel very few women would feel better about themselves if they wrote a poem at that price. At least not more than once. People really feel good about themselves for being unkind to others. For something like of what that happened, I suspect a woman that would feel elated but also distressed, but in her poetic urge continue, she would make some other choices. Could she manage to write poetry and take care of her family too? If not, how important was the poetry to her? If it turned to be something very important needed to do, she would have She'd have to try to get help from other responsibilities, from her other responsibilities. Maybe her husband would be willing to do more. And of course, some artists at that marriage have a marriage and a family just aren't for them, and they choose their art. That's right. A marriage and a family, it just isn't for them, and they choose their art. That's all right, too. I think when Catherine Ann Porter's husband said her and her family and failures of their marriage, but you're already married. You must establish our priorities. You know a lot of women's liber liberationalists argue that the daycare should be widely available so the mothers aren't forced to stay at home with their children and stagnate. I'm not against daycare or careers for women, but having a career is and ought to be a choice. If women want to have babies, they should. If they don't want to raise children, they shouldn't have them. But once they do, they should have a certain responsibility. If they want to try to have both a family and a career, that's their decision. They're taking on a tough challenge. It's up to them to meet it. You can lobby or for daycare centers if they like, but they should feel like they shouldn't feel like victims. But what if you can't manage everything that you'd like to do? Few of us can and have to make choices. One does doing good things for yourself become pure self-indulgence. 
Doing makes you feel good about yourself is really the opposite of self-indulgence. It doesn't mean gratifying an isolating part of you. It means satisfying your whole self. And this includes the feeling that ties and responsibilities you have to others, too. Self-indulgence means satisfying the smallest part of you, in that way only temporarily. It doesn't mean that you have to be self-centered enough to take care of yourself and take care of yourself only. It just means that you have to learn how to do that. You can never care properly for others, the Bible says. Love thy neighbor as thyself, better than or instead of thyself. If we cannot love ourselves... We will have to draw the love for anyone else. People do not love themselves and can adore others because adoration makes someone else big and ourselves small. They can desire others because desires come out of the sense of an inner completeness which demands to be filled. But they cannot love others because love is an affirmation of the living, growing being in all of us. And if you don't have it, you can't give it. Charity begins at home. Yes, you can see the difference between love and what looks like love very clearly in relationships between parents and children. Parents always claim that they're acting out love for their children. It's easy to see when they're not. When a parent sacrifices for a child, you know there's something wrong because of the way the child reacts. The child feels guilty, not grateful, because what he's getting is not out of the love, but out of the self-denial. No one really wants to put fruits on someone else's self-denial. Self-denial is one of the worst kinds of self-indulgence. It's a feeding part that feels worthless. No benefits from that, and no one benefits from that. This doesn't mean that you can't sometimes decide to give things up, but that is a choice that you make, and it is done out of self-regard and not self-hatred. In other words, it's not what you do, but why you do it. And you can keep coming back to the concept of choice. You seem to be saying something about freedom. People are choosing all the time that they want and that they don't want to admit it. People are choosing all the time and they don't want to admit it. You are free when you accept the responsibility of your choices. And when you choose your own best interest, it's not as hard to do as it sounds. It's hard enough when we think of all the times I've known I was doing something I'd regret. When it was on a clear as day, I went ahead with anything and that extra piece of cake that was ir irritable towards my mother, I could scream. I could think of hundreds of times I wanted to wise, to be wise and thoughtful and mature and gracious of all those lovely things and then acting like a brat. But that's what everybody does. Why do you think about the times when you were wise and kind? Remember and dwell defeats instead of victories. Many people are under kind of negative self-hypnosis. They put labels on themselves. They say, I'm A, a terrible person, or B, I'm always awful things, and C, can't possibly do better. Instead of convincing ourselves beforehand that something that we want to do is impossible, we should spend those energies looking for ways to do it. We must encourage ourselves. You can't do anything if you believe you can't. When you insist that you're the kind of person who can climb a mountain and make a speech, all you're saying and all you're saying is that up to now that haven't done? All you're saying is that up to now you haven't done? Sometimes even that's not true. Because if people want to see themselves as unable to do something, they manage to forget the times they actually have done it. But even if they haven't, all they're talking is about their behavior in the past. Who knows what they will do in the future? If we just keep on doing exactly what we've done up to now, people will never change, and people are changing all the time. That's what growth is. Doing things that you've never done before. Some things that you've once done or even dreamt that you could do. I really never climbed a mountain and I'm sure I never will. I really never climbed a mountain and I'm sure I never will. I don't suppose you ever wanted to, of course. Difficulty things are a lot of trouble. You have to want them very badly. But when you don't see limits of your efforts, great things can come out of them. I remember a young woman I referred to on another analysis who didn't tell me anything about her time. I worked with her for a year or so. One year I got a call from an analyst. I ran into the Y on Y Street the other day. He told me that she looked radiant. She was lively and sparkling and happy. What did you do? I asked him what was so unusual, he said. But didn't you know? She was, she was a schizophrenic. I didn't know. I still hadn't treated her in terms of the label. She came along to me fine. It's the same as a homosexual. Analysts thought that they had little chance of changing homosexuals' pre preferences. I had little successions in that direction, but some refused to accept that they kept working on them. We found that the homosexual who really wants to change has a very good chance of doing so. Now hearing all kinds of success stories that... Nat the nature of a homosexuality hasn't changed, but the way of looking at it has. This is what is meant for self-fulfilling prophecy. School children who are classified as low achievers tend to become low achievers and has to do with their teachers' expectations of them. The children have a sense that besides they know the type of class that they're in, no matter what the codes are used, so they learn to expect little themselves. Many low achievers are simply slow growers and children the problems that interfere with learning. But how could they do it very well, given the right encouragement? It's like with the warden of the Federal House of Detention of Manhattan recently of his prisoners. If you treat the individual as he is, he'll stay as he is. But if you treat him as if he were how he ought to be, then he could be or act like he could be. Perhaps he will become that. 
What can all do much more as we think? And we can all do much more as we think, but first we have to believe it. We should try some positive hypnosis for a change. That sounds like positive thinking, perhaps with a bit of cool thrown in it. Every day I'm getting better and better. Every day I'm getting better and better. That kind of pep talk is very popular in this country, but I wonder whether it's done or harm or good. Denying difficulties in the way of overcoming them, it doesn't solve problems. It just helps people avoid facing them. People have smiles on their faces, but they're dragging the same old anchors around. It's unfortunate. Positive thinking has more of a gain of truth in it, but it goes too far, or maybe it goes not f far enough. Doesn't it rely on the willpower of making up your mind? You're using only the tools that you got. You need to make a change. You do need determination, but good things don't come out of forcing yourself. When you try to do it all in the willpower, you're not treating yourself with respect. You're making an assumption that changes has to be imposed from above and yourself have its own impulse to do it better. But it does. Real growth can only come from within. You need to learn to work with yourself. Use the power from yourself, inside of yourself. But yourself must come willingly, of course. That doesn't mean that you can't use some gentle persuasion. And your will must be enlisted to help you accomplish what you really want to do. Many of us set ourselves arbitrary and impossible goals. Someone who thinks that he can do anything, he has the mind. He's not in the contract with himself. It's an arrogant, it's an arrogant belief set with no limits. The struggles to a real... The struggles to re to themselves are open ended, but they're limited by the actual capacities and interests and strivings. It would be futile for me to make up my mind to be a painter if I have no talent in that direction. But the truth is, is if the talent is lacking, the desire will be absent. Two, and if the talent's lacking, the desire will be absent. So if you do have the talent, the desire will grow. The genuine self does want to do things that are utterly foreign to it. It wants to realize its own potential. Of course, people can come up to it with all kinds of crazy notions about what they think they want to do or be. But it's all just a bunch of notions, no genuine impulses. When we use our self-will to achieve the goals and not spring out of us and let it spring out of us, but which we set to sake and pleasing others to fulfill a fantasy about who we are, we create kind of a monster, a mechanical man, in which living ourself is trapped. So we don't need to live in something of what they think we are. We all have seen that people is to held together is to sheer with power and effort of enormous with the result is hardly worth it they aren't people who enjoy being with those aren't the people you those aren't the type of people you enjoy being with or who enjoy being with themselves yet ex-alcoholics often give that impression you could sense a terrible strain in them it's costing them a lot but you can't say your effort isn't worth it because that doesn't come from a real desire for liberation because that it doesn't come from a real desire of liberation yes that's true their tragedy is that many of them don't release the energies from the struggle against from which they don't want to be to spend them on becoming the person that they do want to be. They have taken an important step forward, but they have to go on from there. What I'm trying to say is that if you want to become all that is us to, to become, we have to use everything that we've got. If you want to become all that is in us to become, then we have to use everything we've got. Our feelings, our intuition, our intelligence, and our willpower, our whole self. If we do, the payoff is enormous. Then why don't we do it? Why do so few of us live that way? Because there's no hidden payoff continuing to suffer. For one thing, it's familiar. We're very comfortable with it. We're always comfortable. It gives us a sense of security to keep in the same old self-defeating ways, letting one bad actually do another. We know what to expect. It makes the world comprehensible, predictable, in the same sense, manageable. One of the things that need to be done is the most feeling is living in a world that they understand. That's one of the deepest appeals for religion. That's why people are so disturbed today. That's why the only violence around us but your feeling is that it doesn't make sense. Nothing seems to hang together anymore. The old explanations don't seem to apply. People don't know what to count on anymore. Things seem to be more uncertain. Social chaos is terrifying, but personal chaos is more horrifying. From a very early age, we're looking for ways to organize the chaos. We all start out scientists, sorts. Gradually, we build an interview of the world, which sorts an overwhelming flood of stimuli that come our way and calls some of us good and desirable and safe and others bad and dangerous. We decide that certain actions will get us results we want and others will likely to get us into trouble. So, how does that come about? Each of us creates the kind of working hypothesis which says, this is what life is about. We do when we're very young. We do that when we're very young. And these theories are very often very ingenious and really help us to survive. The trouble is it's too often when we don't revise them. As we grow older and gain more experiences, we keep fitting new experiences into old slots. I'm sure most people would deny that they had any such things, impressions, maybe some prejudices and associations from things that happened to them as children, but hardly anything as sophisticated as a theory. Most people don't know most people don't know how they have won because they have never put into the words of making up their vague feelings, unspoken comprehensions, uh, unspoken apprehensions, 
and the things we don't dare talk about or even admit to ourselves as children. They deal with the most powerful and problematic forces of human life, like sex and aggression, which most families find too formidable to discuss. So normal families find it too hard to talk about sex or sex or aggression. So we develop complex ideas about the nature of reality, which is never to communicate or never to examine. Some say that God created the world and fit for an absent-mindedness. We, we do almost as well. We build world views half asleep and let them, like tinted lenses, color our lives. You mean, most important ideas about life are ones we are not even aware of? Most important ideas about life are the ones we're not even aware of, and we've been carrying them around since childhood? Yes, and their impact can be very powerful. Often what we think is responding to actual people and events, we're merely signing them as part of an inner novel. We're writing them into our lives. For example, if someone has felt deserted as a child by an important adult, this becomes a key experience in his way he's seeing the world. There are several ways from he can continue to have the experience. One way is to seek that kind of people who are likely to desert him as an adult. And we are all very clever about that. And others to drive people away by his own behavior. Or he can imagine he is deserted by people who really haven't mistreated him at all. Whatsoever he chooses, he conforms his theory about that and expects that from others. And this is very gratifying. Come on, that certainly doesn't sound like any way to have fun. You'd be surprised. Being right is one of the most satisfying experiences in the world. Or let's say, rather, being wrong is one of the most undersettling experiences that can happen to anyone. It's an awful blow to an ego to feel that you made a mistake. That's why people don't want to have change. You can be admitting all the time that you're wrong. A patient once burst out indignantly, but would mean I wasted the first 40 years of my life. Some people will go and make mistakes to another 40 years and admit that they cut their losses. People are very stubborn, sometimes secretly believe that if they keep on long enough, they're misconceived behavior they'll make it right the reality it gives into their views rather than a vice versa they're still trying to get their parents to give in they haven't given in the anger over they over what they didn't get from when they were five years old people feel very unjustified with anger people feel very justified with anger they give all the details on how fairly they were un how all the details of how they were unfairly treated they're usually right they did get cheated as children but what they don't see is that they are now cheating themselves as adults as long as they spend their energies being angry at people who deprive them once or deprive them once they won't spend their effort on getting for themselves what they can get and need now the rage isn't hurting their parents but it's crippling them damn it it doesn't seem fair you may know that just seem you you mean we should just let them get away with it wipe the slate clean after all they put us through it isn't fair. Life is not fair. And they did not get away with it. There's nothing to get away with. And how, what about now? There's no way even to score. Hamlet eventually even score. Like all the lots of the tragic heroes, you can only lead with the death or exile. Electra bought you the mother's death and never saw her home again. Life lies in another direction. It lies in letting go and giving up your grievances. You could stop your parents from getting away from your whole life, but you can't stop yourself from giving up your whole life. So we just have to write it off. All the suffering, all the years, all the belief as children, all the upsetnesses and letdowns as children. We have to accept that none of ever was. It was just a thought. That's all we thought. It was. It's everything ever was was only as what we thought it was. But in a sense, it was what you thought it was then. What people really understand is that they're not wrong at the time that they made up their theories. It's not wrong to think of how you thought of it. And don't mean to be a bundle of unspoken apprehensions gave an accurate picture of the world. You don't mean that bundle of unspoken apprehensions gave an accurate picture of the world. No. But it was the best that we had at dealing with our corner of the world. We all start out being the smallest, least powerful person in our immediate world, the family. Our helplessness is not a theory, it's a fact. It's in early stages coping with our world that has us working throughout the years. At five, we need our mother. We must please and pacify her and get things that we need. Our life literally depends on doing so to accomplish our own as children. We must be able to manipulate adults to get candy from a candy bar or go to the movies. We must win them over so it's appropriate for a child to look into others to learn how to evoke their love, sympathy, and understanding. We can look to ourselves only secondarily. The mistakes lies in carrying a sense of helplessness, the need to placate others into adulthood which once a fact that has become a fantasy as an adult everything doesn't depend on pleasing others the others once did for you can now do for yourself when you're 30 you do need 
your mother for love and the way that she makes you feel when you were three, but you don't need to feel her or treat her as you did then. You don't have the fear of the anger anymore. You can stop wearing the ties like she likes and dating women and you can improve of. That's all over now and it's ancient history. And now you're your own man. You're your own woman now. And many people will not realize that. Why not? Why don't they grab that freedom? Freedom is now. Freedom is all you have and it's right now. They're terrible and they're afraid, terribly afraid of losing something that they think they cannot do without. You know the French philosopher Rousseau made a statement and is often quoted, man is born free but everywhere he is in chains it is closer to the truth to say man is born in chains but each of us has the potential to be free too often people cling to their chains even after they've outgrown them well yes I guess the obvious is people especially other people do that but why is in the world that we do that why are we so afraid to let go it's actually a childlike sense of security we're holding on to as long as we feel small and helpless we feel that the presence of invisible all powers of adults may not be very nice to adults they're always expecting them to blame us or yell at us so as long as they're there we're not alone that's the thing that we fear most if they disapprove parents go away we will be all by ourselves but the feeling too is left over from four years old to have abandoned a terrifying prospect to a child that literally couldn't survive it but the adult aloneness something quite it's the adult lonely aloneness is something quite different for an adult aloneness is something quite different he has not only that he has to survive he often needs aloneness to grow to get to know himself to develop his powers something he cannot tolerate aloneness something he doesn't have to be is he doesn't know his own grown up he doesn't know he's grown up it takes courage to let go of the fantasy of a childhood safety the world may never seem to be a certain way again but the fresh air will breathe when when he takes possession of his own separateness his own integrity and that's when the adult life really begins when you get your own separateness and your own integrity your adult life begins when you say it I can feel it it sounds wonderful and yet frightening too something how bleak it makes me feel on my own so exposed something to me pulls back from it I could say why and I couldn't say why not only you many people hold themselves back from taking that step the reason is that they have very distorted ideas about what will happen if they go ahead as a childhood myth when they were small there was a man or a woman in the world our parents they have big ones or big adults child experiences is is that the only way that he could do things so he would get would be is to get lost in an idea that can only be one man or one woman and if anyone has the audacity to set himself up as an adult he must knock himself someone else down he is imbued with a competitive sense of life to pay Paul he must rob Peter and this view of life may often be confirmed by his parents who share the same stingy outlook if there is not enough to go around or the achievements one will inevitably be resented by others how desperate every action then becomes if we take our lives into our own hands it feels like life taking life is away from someone else we feel literally as if we are dealing with the death of our parents no wonder people hesitate if the consequences are so devastating what villains are becoming what villains we become if we simply start living out our own lives. People can't face feeling like killers so they back down. But we have to face the feeling and go ahead anyway. It's the price of self-assertion. But I don't blame them for backing down. I wouldn't want to feel like a killer. People have enough guilt without that. You have to live without those feelings. You ever want to grow up completely. If you ever want to grow up completely, you have to live without those feelings. What you're killing is not your parents, but your fear for them. Your fear for their power over you. In a very ruthless, primitive way, you have to choose yourself over them. You have to go subordinating your needs and impulses and wishes for your needs and stopping and not for theirs. You will never come into your own. You need to do your you need to make your basic assertion. You will see that no one else will end up dead on the battlefield no one will end up dead on the battlefield if you come up with your own assertion except old ghosts unless of course you wait too long the reality may accommodate itself to your fantasies I know someone who imagined that if he ever had a child he would kill it would kill her his mother so she waited until she was 45 and in fact her mother did die at about the same time but the outcome is usually much less dramatic the economy of emotional scarcity is that the source of so much jealousy and conflict and resentment is really a myth it's a magical thinking which vastly exaggerates our impacts on the rest of the world it's not like that at all what you achieve doesn't take anything away from anyone else whatever you do the world will continue to go on about its business people must complete the real things in the real world like jobs and scholarships but that's not what I'm talking about they don't have to complete their own good opinion if you become more it doesn't make me less there's room for many marvelous people in the world and many wonderful achievements if we really grasp this and take pleasure in what others are able to do and take pleasures of what others are able to do and do what and do not feel diminished 
then we'll be able to do our own thing without feeling anxious or guilty towards anyone. We actually live in an, econ an economy in emotional abundance. There is more life to go around. Developing our human resources doesn't use them up. It only enlarges our possibilities, and those resources do not keep. If you do not mine them now, they are lost forever. That's another thing people don't face. They think they, enter, they think they have eternity before them. Humans are humans. They don't have eternity before them. That's what they don't know. They can't do tomorrow, the day after, what they should do now. They think that they're playing a game, that they're holding a long enough. If they hold out long enough, they'll win. Eventually, the other side will give up and give them what they want. But this is not a game. There is no other side. If we are holding on long enough, we'll lose all the chances. We don't have eternity. We only have time, and that's what we have to work with. There's no limits to how much we can grow up and develop, but the time limits us. We must know this, and of course, people are often obsessed with aging, what time does to them, and aging of what time does to them. Instead, they should be concerned about what they do with time. It sounds so wise and beautiful. I would like to wrap it up and take home with me, but it's so much easier to say than do it. Isn't this asking too much of people who has the power to keep that steady eye on reality? I think I know a few things about life, but I often lose track of them. I get discouraged and impatient. I need the reassurance. I worry about what might happen in the future. Can people expect to be that mature? They don't have to be totally mature. That's another thing people don't understand. They envision adulthood as a door that opens. They think that once they step through it, they can never return. Growing up is not a one-way trip. Adults can be childish. childish. Children can act very grown up. Two states are, aren't mutually exclusive, which is lucky. Otherwise, the generations would have more than, more than, more than a gap. They would face an underbridge abyss. I know that's what my parents think as they face now. But that's what's usually lacking in a genuine desire to understand, to make the imaginative Effort to accept the fact that others are different from you. It's all right to be immature at times. People who are totally adults are a little intimidating. People who are just full-blown adults are intimidating. That's the wonderful thing about marriage. A good marriage is a very adult relationship, but husbands and wives can still do things around each other. They could be parents, playmates, as well as lovers, partners. They can be babied when you needed it, and they could do all of that. The only time you run into trouble is when you both want to be babied at the same time. The only only one of you isn't willing to give it up. That's a very nice to hear, very reassuring. I do feel better knowing that I don't have to suffer or I don't have to be a super adult. I think I used to try to do that, and it made people feel as if I was looking down on them. They didn't like that at all. You didn't feel good about being a child, but there's a child in each of us. And we should kind and cling to that child as a kind of child. Another thing people should realize that it's when they give up something at 25 that they're taking it from their 40-year-old self who once had a need for it. Somebody can take away what happened when they were four years old. But when you do this in compassionate to the four-year-old who is still within you, adults can often tender it towards to a four-year-old. And when they find themselves feeling or behaving like one, they react in horror. They become disgusted with themselves and disclaim the child that is in part still there. They probably started doing this very clearly and very early. Somehow the process of growing up from which they should be basically reaching out to a new ways of handling experience. The emphasis shifts to feeling bad about old ways. This is really the beginning of self-hatred. Generally growth having as courage of confidence to try new things and in this process to let go of old ones but you move on because you are more interested and exciting and excited to take on new challenges you may be scared too but you're also attracted this doesn't mean you have to despise self you were or the self you were is just let go of what you don't need anymore because you are something better learn to let go of something you don't need anymore just to be something better that sounds easy like things just falling into place and appearing when they needed Growing isn't easy, but growing isn't easy. The pain, it's painful to grow, and it's terribly difficult. You're not sure of where you're going to go, whether how are you going to get there. There's so much uncertainty and so much ambivalence. Of course, of course, growing pains are very real, and when children are struggling with the important new step forward, they sometimes have to brush away their old habits rather violently. They don't need them anymore, but partly they still do, so their behavior can quite contrary and unsettling to those loose to those around them. Any parents know what I'm talking about, but that is the rejection of earlier self that goes deep and becomes more persuasive. The result is not growth, but self-hatred. The person may learn to do without satisfying the needs he feels and he ought to have when he's outgrown, but he's impoverished by the effort. We should grow not by turning against our earlier self, but by building on its strengths. We should recognize that it served us as well, and it's time for something else. When is when is it someone said, what is it someone said that the only way to true adulthood is through a real childhood? 
Yes, it's a good childhood is liberating. Good parents help their child move on. The tragedy is bad childhood is that people tend to get hooked on it. So they go through life looking over their shoulders, something that they once had or that they had or wanted. They waste years trying to recapture the bliss that they had too little of it, that that they had too little of as infants instead of capturing the joy that they could have as adults. That's what addicts are often looking for in drugs, isn't it? Yes. They want to go back to a happiness, but it doesn't work. So they have to go ahead. It's much harder back from what they know to expect, although no one can really get back there, which is the attempt to go desperate. Going ahead means of taking chances, trying things that you never tried and said earlier about being sure that whether or not you can get there. The hardest thing is when you, the hardest thing is when you must give something up. And you don't see what you'll get if you do. That's why people don't want to stop suffering. They know that they, they know what they've got, and they really don't believe that there's anything else. One Faulkner's characteristics, between grief and nothing, I'll take grief. But our choices between grief and full life, to take the first steps towards a full life may be painful. And you may have an endured sharp pangs and loneliness and loss. But you're lonely anyhow if your loss happened long ago. What you're losing now is only a dream. You must be strange. You must be a strange awakening. It must be a strange awakening, like opening your eyes for the first time, like being born. It must be a strange awakening. Only this is now is you're not naked. You're only ready to be awakened as a adulthood. You're awakened into your adulthood, and here you have to take in whatever it is and cope with it. You said you must take the first steps. Which are those steps? How does one start? The first step is to let go of the dream, rather to loosen its holds and give in up to it, because nobody does it all at once. This is such a basic step that no one could tell anyone how to take it. Somehow has the dawn, partly dawning of how futile, but unrewarding the effort to hold on to it, and partly the dawning of the senses that there might be something infinitely more exciting ahead if one does abandon those fruitless efforts. It makes me think of an old movie, Hold Back the Dawn, but there's anything people can do is bring... Bring on the dawn. You start by pay, paying attention. You start by paying attention. If the paying attention, if things keep turning out the way you don't want them, ask yourself, well, what are you doing to make the outcome come this way? So the connection between you, you could find it, what you could do, and how you feel. You may have it sit. You may have to sit yourself and demand some answers. Why do you go on being unkind or unfriendly to yourself? Why do you trip yourself out? Why do you trip yourself up? Why are you getting out? Why? What are you getting out of it? What kind of vision? of yourself are you holding on to? Do you secretly think that you act helpless enough? Someone will help take over for you? Do you really think failure will make you lovable? You talked earlier about the inner and novel from been writing all over our lives. If we've been writing all over our lives, this sounds like a form of play acting, going through our part of private drama, hoping someone will play another character that we've cast. But if it's all fantasy, why do we give ourselves such a thankful role? That's just the point. They're not thankless as they seem. They're not thankless as they seem. In all the bad things that we do to ourselves, there's usually an expectation of some kind of reward. Punishment, after all. We could be a, real, a very real reward. Some children feel loved. Some children feel loved when they're being punished. But the only other thing is they get from their parents is indifference. And that's the worst of all. So adults keep on trying to rise out of the people who they once mattered to us. We'll put ourselves through all kinds of hell just as they feel and they're still, still around. They'll put themselves through all kinds of hell just to feel they're still around. But they're not around anymore. We collect no credits for their pains or for our pains. We've been communicating with ghosts, even if the ghosts of people are still alive. I suppose ghosts can seem better than nothing. That's the tragedy of it. We think that if we give up the reassurance of those unseen presences, we'll have no one. And the truth is, and it is true that if we let them go, we'll have no experiences to pain of separation. That's a sense of a loneliness, and every mature individual must know. But if you have the courage to endure the wrench, that awareness, if you pave a way of something far better than the childlike dependence you gave up, the true intimacy is one that's possible between equals, between adults, from when fun really begins, when people are full possessions of themselves, when they really know who they are, when they really know who they are and are who they are. And that's when they can really open themselves to others. When they can stop trying to get from people what they can't give you. They can begin to enjoy what they can offer. People can share w w whole worlds with each other. From first they must access their own. You mean for adults intimacy is something quite different from inti intimacy as a child knows or wants. And far more enjoy enjoyable for an adult. When the, only, when the only kind of closeness you know can imagine is the child to a parent... You want to have a closeness desperation, but you have to fear it too because it's an ultimate form. It reduces you, literally, to a gibbering idiot. The last stop in that direction is the womb. 
If you seek closeness to feeling small and finding protected shelter in something big, there is always the fear of disappearing altogether. But adults' love does not diminish the lover. It enhances us. It makes us more. You mean the risk of love is not as great as we think? No. No one can take the risk of love you're, that's being offered to you, and you can always, you can always, it can always be rejected. When you expose your being, when you are exposed for being to someone, you inevitably take a chance of being hurt. That's why some people prefer not to love at all, and they'd rather live closed in themselves and risk the pain of exposure of nakedness and love, or what it implies. But an adult, when he loves, does not risk his whole identity that he already has. He will never, however, the other responds, he loses his lover, he will still have himself. But if you look to someone else established in your identity, for you, it's some way losing that person can make you really feel destroyed. You mean that even in the deepest love, you keep a sense of separateness? At moments of great closeness, there is no consciousness of separate selves, but that deep sharing of self is different from being swallowed up. I wouldn't want a life without love in it. Who would? Everything you do is richer and fuller when love is there, but love is not always there. How would you feel about yourself at times? It isn't someone around you to receive or return your love. It has a lot to do with how rewarding the experiences of love is when you have it. I think that the great aunt of mine, now in her mid-80s, who lives alone on the edge of California desert, I once asked her what she did with her time. Her answer was, well, there's not enough hours in a day. We visited her recently and found out that what she meant. Well, when we were there, she entertained her literally, she entertained her literary group. This is a weekly selection to read in advance of a cake bake. She also takes a course in creative writing. In between her cult cultural activities, she raises things in the garden, visits people and carries a voluminous correspondence with friends, relatives, people on the radio shows, and just making busy work for herself either. <clears throat> She genuinely enjoys everything she does. A few years ago, I took a trip abroad herself and had a wonderful time. She stayed with us a while, and the way she backed with her pleasure, and she came around again. She was always glad to spend time with us, but she was perfectly happy when she was busy elsewhere. We never had a feeling that she was waiting for us to come and entertain her. She never had to look that says she never had that look that said feed me. She had always found herself to feed herself. So we're back to the question of how we how do we go about it? How do we learn to feed ourselves? It's important to learn to listen to ourselves. Most of us learn to tune ourselves out. We start to receive our messages loud and clear. Babies know when they're hungry, so when they hurt. But when the smaller other people's voices are, much louder and surer than our own, it's easier to go along with what others say. They've got it all figured out already. We're just starting to put the pieces together. Besides, it's their side of bread it's buttered on. And if we listen to them, we get the room aboard. When we can offer ourselves a complete to complete with that. How can we offer ourselves to compete with that if we just listen to everybody else? It's another story that we had to survive as children. We don't need to keep doing those same things any longer. Turning again takes practice. Turning in again takes practice. We have to encourage ourselves to speak up. If we stop listening to our own voices a long time, the voice has to be very faint. I have been, and I have given up. In many ways, also to be pretty angry that I've shut, I can't believe I've been shut out so long. But it's there. We have to give it a chance. We've learned how to listen. Now we'll find out a lot and we will hear some wonderful things. I suspect we may have some terrible things too. Isn't there a lot hidden in us that would be pretty hard to take? We would be too much for people to handle for themselves if it did surface. Isn't that what psychoanalysts are for? To help people dig it up and get it out and sort it out and maybe eventually be free of it? Analysts can help people a great deal, of course, in delving into the reasons why they mistreat themselves. Some people are so caught up in doing harm to themselves, they have little understanding of why they even do it. That analysts, the, analysts, the analysis is that only the only way that they can begin to break out of their self-destructive spiral is that they can help to get around the roadblocks that stand in the way of the growth. The roadblocks are often put into place by others from which... We work hard to keep there. The analyst is a great tool of liberation. When the first patient lay down on the couch, it was truly a giant step for mankind. But there is so much people can do off the couch. I don't mean to imply that you can't be analyzed sitting up. By the way, I even done it successfully over the telephone. And there's much people have done to do, the, to do for themselves, even with the analysis help. One reason analysis sometimes takes a long step in refusal of many people to realize that at bottom, changes is up to them. At the bottom, at bottom, changes up to them. No matter how many insights they have, no matter how many insights they gain, no matter how much emotional catharsis they may achieve, change just does, change does not just happen. But I have the impression that sometimes change does simply come. I know that I know it has happened to me. Suddenly you feel very different about someone or something. Burdens are lifted. Doors are open. Something you were struggling with becomes easy all at once. Miracles do happen, and it's a good thing. 
because they help people going in the same struggles that must come first. A lot of plugging goes into the making of miracles. They happen to be people who are reading for themselves, and they read to them. But it takes more than just the sudden leap of change in life. It takes a conscious act, decision to take our own lives into our hands. A lot of people don't want to face that decision. And they think of their own analysis as good father or good mother that they, they, that they never had. And that from now on, they'll be taken care of. They're partly right. And the one and the most important thing is that analysis can give them a loving interest. But people forget that good parents is the one who helps the child care for himself and take care of himself. Someone has said that if you give a man food, you'll feed him for a day. But if you teach him how to grow his own, he can feed himself for life. When you decide to take care of yourself... Take charge of yourself. There's still a big job ahead. It takes thought and effort. Share free and bad habits. And to shed free all bad habits, a part of your way to be quite uh, in, indignant at the changes you're trying to make. To make a part of your life that's quite comfortable in the old ways and has no desire to see things or do differently can put up quite a fight. A lot of us would rather do almost anything but change. But seriously, we must go deeper than just changing comfortably ha comfortable habits. There's more at stake than that. All the things that we've been talking about here are at stake. Our illusions, our fantasies are at stake. Our sense of being right about our own zest we're talking about at the beginning. Where does spontaneity come from? Your enthusiasm, your belief, your passion, your zest. People often talk about wanting to be spontaneous, to live out their feelings, that they've locked themselves into intellectual boxes where they've hardly known it and are filtered it anymore. They become desperate to express it in plain, simple emotion. They think of it that they could throw it away in their minds and they would be free. This is the appeal of D.H. Lawrence's ideas. By neither freedom nor feelings are that simple. Freedom nor feelings are that simple. We have in us a catch-all, a programmed reaction, remembering scolding, school books, maxim, nostalgia, and old wives' tales, all mixed up with the true feelings. So in practice, spontaneity usually means grabbing the first thing that floats to the mind and taking it as if it was a message from our depths. And there's a lot of pollution in those depths. We have to examine the actions that surface there and where the messages really come from. We have to decide whether to act on it or to represent our true. In or does it represent our true interest? This doesn't mean that you have to watch yourself every. Every minute, you don't have to become a self-conscious and a centipede. You forgot how to walk. But living out your own true feelings does take work. To live out your own true feelings, if you're willing to invest the effort, the zest will come. People say that they want to let go, that they really need to do this and take hold. Only when you're really ready to in charge of yourself can you afford to let go. The spontaneity you expect, good to come out of it. That's why sex is more satisfying for adults. Only mature adults have the self-possession to abandon themselves and know they'll come into intact. It sounds like a paradox, but it is the one of secrets of love. It's one of the secrets of love. You're convincing me. It sounds better and better. I'm sure I know enough. I know enough. Yet. What else can I do? You must also learn to talk to yourself. That's very important. You need to explain things and reassure yourself. You need to establish an ongoing dialogue. I can help you through all kinds of tough situations. As a child... You are as up to being up to mischief. You could stop to discuss it first. You could tell himself no. There's usually a moment when you can go either way. If you pay attention, you could take care of the moment and consider that you really want to do. You have the power to stop yourself. This is a good thing to know. At first it's hard, but it gets easier. It sounds as if a man's freedom may hinge on just a little pause. What a narrow margin it is. It sounds as if a man's freedom may hinge on just a little pause. What a narrow margin it is. You won't always use it as well, either. But when a child... But when a child in you does misbehave, don't punish yourself. You've done that enough. Forgive your child. Forgive the child in you. Most of the things you feel terribly weren't so bad to begin with. You often go on doing things against yourself just to prove that we are terrible persons we've imagined as we were when we were child, children. We suffer because such imagined sins over our deep feelings from our parents or our rage when we let us down or loss of faith in ourselves and another child was born and our star turned was over. And our star turn was over. We're told to hate sin and love the sinner, but we're told to apt twist around in the other way. We hate the sinner in us and cling to the sin. Don't glorify your lapses. Just try to understand what, why they happen and steer yourself back to the right track. All the kind and thoughtful things that you would do towards a living child, all the loving help that would give to that child, you can give to yourself. When you know a child well, you have to feel that you can put on the pressure when to offer comfort you have to leave him alone you have to come and know you have to come to know your child in you you have to get to know and get a feel for yourself and you can know when to be easy you know when to make demands know when to get familiar in terms of yourself embrace the child in you makes friends with yourself it gives such a reserve of strength to call on and once again seeing a man in a grieving deeply a person who has the closest hand has died and felt utterly desolate sat with him and he could feel the depths of his sorrow finally i said to him yes look as if you had lost your best friend he said well i have and I said, don't you know your best friend is? He said, and looks at me surprised. 
He thought as a moment and the tears came into his eyes. Then he said, I guess it's true. You, you are my best friend. If we do all this, it is to understand all these things. Would it really make such a difference in our lives? If we can learn to love and nurture ourselves, we will find ourselves in a richer, richer life than we've ever even imagined. We will still be the best at real problems and suffer real defeats. Life is not a picnic or a rose garden. The world is not run out for our benefits. There is no escaping human condition, which involves pain and difficulties and loss. But we can bring everything from which to bear of challenges and life presents to make it the very most of what it offers to us. If we liberate ourselves from our fantasies and learn from our real resources, lie on a whole world that's waiting to be explored. People often have a good need in themselves and it's worn out, having tried everything, exhausted their resources, used up everything that they have, as if they've given up on themselves. Yet, when they begin to make themselves available, ourselves for possibilities, it's like drilling as well to an untapped energy reserve, like finding a bank account we haven't yet used. It's the cheapest form of entertainment there is. You can never run out. You are never bored. It's also an old age security. When Bernard Berenson, the art critic, was almost 90, he said, I would willingly stand at street corners, hat in hand, begging passerbys to drop their unused minutes into it. He never lost his capacity, capacity for enjoying moments to the full. You could say, well, he was an exceptional man, but we can all do it. It sounds like the secret of living is to love each moment. I wish I could believe we can all learn to live like that. There's no question that we can. I've seen so many people do it, really come into their lives. We can all help ourselves change to grow to become a person that is in us to be. We can learn to be our own best friend, and if we do, we'll have a best friend for life. We could buy ourselves up, giving ourselves comfort and sustenance, sustenance in times from when there is no one else. We could be our own source of encouragement and good advice. We are accustomed to waiting for someone to give us a kind word from really has no available to ourselves many kind words. I feel that I've learned many secrets from you. I've heard many wise words. I hope I can remember them. Of course you'll remember them. You knew them all the time. How to be your own best friend.